a little Van Halen for you in the morning. Van Halen right now mixed with the French tricolore. The French flag here that came about during the revolution. I'm going to put that down. Have a seat there. Uh, right now, a song about boldness, aggressiveness, standing up for something, seizing the moment. Very Napoleon. Hence, that's why I chose the song. This is our fourth installment, I think, in this unit. This one called Napoleon, if you like. Where are we? We're on the bottom of page six. Booyah. We will talk about Napoleon, and then we'll make our way all the way to 1815 and the Congress of Vienna. I hope you're doing well. I taped the last video about 10 minutes ago. Update, it is still cold. It's not like Lambeau Field cold, but it's cold. What events led to Napoleon's seizure of power in France? I talked at the end of the last video about the inefficiency of the directory government in the reactionary phase of the French Revolution. They couldn't get anything done. There were too many people in control. And so someone like Napoleon who is sending letters home about his military victories and his decisiveness and his boldness looks like an appealing option. The French seem to have a little bit of a soft spot for that aggressive individual that's willing to take the reins of the moment. That's the Maximilian Robespierre. That's the, in a sense, the, the Henry IV, the Louis XIV in them. And we're going to see that same sense of adventure in Napoleon. So seeing an opportunity to use the military to put down revolts, Napoleon sweeps to power in France and quickly makes himself the controlling individual of the society. Now, we've got this big chart in front of us, and we should frame all of this under the idea that Napoleon considered himself a child of the Enlightenment. He said that he was an individual who was committed to assuring that the society, over a stretch of time, was enlightened. Now, we're going to see that that's true, but we're also going to see that occasionally that's not the case. Okay? So, for instance, Napoleon crowns himself as emperor, Emperor meaning that there's no democratic process, that he is the only individual who can say anything in the society. Hmm, not very enlightened there, Napoleon. Napoleon. I should do this. I got the right height for it, right? Get me a little hat. I could do it. Policies with the church. Napoleon realizes that the longest-running mistake of the French Revolution is the way that it's removed the Catholic Church from the daily life of the French people. Regardless of what sort of hokey setup you had during the French Revolution with the Day of the Ox and the Day of the Pickaxe, the French people still remained devoutly Catholic, and they wanted to be able to practice that religion. Napoleon aligned France back with the Catholic Church, recognizing that the Church was the primary religion of the French people, but, 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 it was not the official religion of France. Uh, Napoleon believes in the Enlightenment so much that we need to have the ability for anyone to have whatever religion they want to have, and that's a small distinction, but an important distinction within the society. Uh, the Code Napoleon is a set of laws whereby every individual is equal under the law. Now, of course, we're not, we're not talking about women. Uh, this is a society that would have said that all men were equal under the law. We'll talk more about his policies toward women in a moment. But Napoleon established a law code that took all of the ideals of the French Revolution, the early moderate phase, and permanently enshrined them into one law code. So, so far, he's looking like a good enlightened individual. Family and women's rights? Not so much. Okay, women were considered to be property in many cases. They had the legal rights of a child. Napoleon re-entrenches the patriarchy of France to assure that men are in charge. So, women, if you're looking for that moment in the French Revolution where you surge to power and you're suddenly in control, no. Uh, it doesn't happen across the stretch of the French Revolution. There are great moments, but there is not a movement. That's the bell in the background. You can tell I'm at school. Uh, meritocracy. Napoleon does establish a meritocracy based on your abilities and the, the notion that you could rise through the ranks as someone of talent. Now, keep in mind that Napoleon's an individual who did that. Napoleon is not born of the bluest blood. Sure, he has a pretty good background in his family. It's middle class. But Napoleon rises because of his, his pluck and because of his daring, because of his aggressiveness. Because really, he's willing to take a situation and make it his own. And by doing that, Napoleon assures that he becomes powerful. He wants to assure that other people have that chance as well. Punctuation point with the bell. Here it comes. There it is. All right, censorship. 
Uh, this is the side where you're like, oh, not very enlightened. And Napoleon shut down opposition newspapers. If you spoke out against Napoleon, that was it. He banned the publication of any books that were critical of him. Uh, important to the empire's strength, he thought, was that we were all of the same mindset. So not very tolerant there. Policies did Napoleon institute in areas that he conquered or formed alliances with. Napoleon made sure that in areas that he took over, that they exported the revolution to those areas. So, importantly, they took apart the privileges of the clergy and the nobility in other realms, and they also pushed a strong sense of nationalism. Now, Napoleon intended to push a sense of French nationalism. He was attempting to get other people to really fall in love with the French way of doing things. Unfortunately, what he ended up doing was really engendering other people's nationalism. I say unfortunately, I mean for him. But for other people, this is a, a moment where we're planting a seed of nationalism that the 19th century is going to germinate over a long period of time. We'll come back to that in a couple months. What was the purpose of the Continental System? The Continental System is Napoleon's chance to try and defeat the English. The English have a stranglehold on Europe that's really economic, in the same sense that Napoleon has a stranglehold that's political and military. The only way that Napoleon can conquer the English, having failed to really control their navy and therefore invade them across the English Channel, is to conquer them economically. He does that by grouping together all of the territories allied with France and getting them to commit to a continental system, whereby they will trade only with each other and not with the English. The hope was that you could starve the English out. By taking away the people that they sold to, you could force them into a position where they no longer had anyone to sell to, and England would eventually collapse, right? Napoleon referred to the English as a nation of shopkeepers, and he said it in a very uh, way. The, the hope is that the English would fall apart. Unfortunately, what it forced was countries to move outside of that system and break the rules. And the first country to do that was Russia, a country that's always had a problem feeding itself and providing its own resources. The Russians eventually traded with the English in 1812, and that made Napoleon angry. Now, he's got two choices. You can invade Russia, daunting. Or you can let the Russians get away with it and hope nobody else tries to get away with it as well, daunting as well. And eventually Napoleon invades Russia, and by invading Russia, he brings upon his own demise. Uh, the winter and the dwindling number of troops across a huge long supply line eventually undo Napoleon. He returns to Europe uh, to be defeated. He's exiled. He comes back from his exile. He's defeated again, and then he's exiled even further away. So in our next video, we're going to talk about the period of 1815 to 1830. Hope you're having a good day, folks. Take care of yourselves.